encourage you to open your Bibles to the New Testament book of Hebrews. Hebrews. We're going to look in chapter 3 in just a moment. Hebrews in chapter 3. I want to thank you very much for inviting me, Rachel, out to worship with you this weekend. Uh, I've really been looking forward to it. I've been really praying about this week. I've been praying for you. I want to tell you how much I appreciate you. Appreciate your love for God. Appreciate your, your stance uh, on the truth and your appreciation for God's will revealed. Appreciate these elders very much and their wives. I'm very thankful to know them. Um, I'm very impressed with uh, JR. Uh, the first time I, I, I hadn't actually met JR, I wasn't even a Christian yet, sitting in a pew like you are, uh, wanting the truth, and I'd never seen or heard anyone like JR preach the gospel. And I remember it. He left uh, an indelible print on my mind, snappy dresser. And I thought, I thought in that in that pew, who is this cowboy? And uh, didn't really know him, and, and I wasn't converted yet. I don't believe, but I did get to know him at preacher training classes, some some classes he he conducts, and uh, got to know Sue a little bit there, and have come to appreciate J.R. and Sue very much. I love them very deeply, and you're very blessed to have them here. J.R. said that uh, I can tell you a little bit about myself. I'm going to forego that this evening. I hope we can have time to talk about that later on. But tonight we want to consider Jesus. Open up to the book of Hebrews in chapter 3. You know, sometimes in Scripture, we're not asked to act. Sometimes we're just act to meditate, just told to, to think about some things, think about a, a deep truth and consider that truth. And what the Hebrew writer says time and time again throughout the book in different ways is we need to consider Jesus more deeply. We waste so much of our time considering other things and meditating on other things that don't matter at all and we can waste our lives considering other things. But we want to tonight, this Friday night, consider Jesus for just a few moments. Hebrews chapter 1, if you're familiar with the book, the author proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is the Son of God. He is the Son of God whom through God has spoken in a final, definitive, and perfect way. And the book opens with a bang. In, in chapter 1, verse 1, God, after He spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways in these last days. Those are the days that you and I live in. He has spoken to us in His Son or through His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, through whom also He made the world. You read through chapter 1 and you see that God has spoken through Jesus in a final and definitive way. You go to chapter 2 and what's the logical conclusion of that? If God has spoken through His Son in a final definitive way, then therefore we have to consider what He says very closely. We need to listen to the word of the exalted Christ. He was humbled in a very unique way. The divine Son, the Creator, the radiance of God has made all things, who holds all things together. He became a man. He became like you and me. To struggle through life. To feel pain. He became like you and me. Why? That He might taste death. He might taste death for everyone. Chapter 2 and verse 9. But, you know the story. He was exalted from death. He was risen and in verse 1 of chapter 2, for this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. And so from the outset, chapter 3, the author hones in on a very specific aspect of the earthly life of Jesus. Namely, he talks about Jesus being faithful. His faithfulness. Chapter 2 and verse 17. Therefore He had to be made like His brethren in all things so that He might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation uh, for the sins of the people. Chapter 12 begins the same way. You're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses who were faithful to God. 
Now you need to consider Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus, this man who endured it all. Don't entangle yourself with those sins. Look to Jesus. Consider Him. And in His faithfulness, when we really think about Jesus, that's going to serve to motivate us on to faithfulness. It's going to remind us that Jesus and Jesus alone is worthy of my consideration. Every thought that passes through my mind is filtered through who Jesus is. Every word that passes through my lips is filtered through what Jesus came to do. Every deed that I work with my fingers and my hands needs to be done in reference to this man, Jesus Christ. Every striving against sin in my life, every breath I have to give, every exertion of my will, every ounce of loyalty that I can muster, it needs to all be done in consideration of this person. Jesus, the Son of God. And therefore, it's, it's Him. And Him alone that we consider this, this time. You know what that word means? To contemplate Him. Meditate upon Him. Give careful notice to Him. Why? So that we might know Him. And we might follow Him without compromise. That is Christianity. Follow in the footsteps of the One who's died for us. And so let's read chapter 3 and verse 1 together. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. Four very simple points straight from this text tonight. Consider Jesus. First of all, he calls these people who he's writing to holy brethren. I know that you are holy brethren. Holy, that is sanctified. You've been set apart by the truth of God's Word, by the work of the Spirit of God through this Word. You've been set apart from the world by the Word of God. That's what Jesus prayed for you in John 17. Yes, He prayed for His disciples. But He prays for all those who might believe on Him through their Word, that they might be sanctified in truth. God, Your Word is truth. <coughs> yeah, we know how difficult that is world We're watching it just kind of trudge along the path of rebellion in darkness in misery we were on that pathway but the light of the gospel shone on you and by faith you welcomed it Moses what did he reveal the law what did the law reveal our sin it worked death in us Moses revealed the law but Grace and truth, John 1.17, came by this man, Jesus. You were a vessel of dishonor. That's all you were good for. You were a bedpan. You were an instrument of unrighteousness, Romans chapter 6. Carried about by every wind of doctrine, obedient to the Spirit that works disobedience. But what happened? <laughs> what did you do? You considered Jesus. You opened up this book and you, and you considered Him. And that changed everything. The things that were once common, they're clean. Jesus can make them holy. He set you apart in this Word. He's ransomed you by the violent shedding of His blood. Why? Because in the violent shedding of His blood, He can make you holy. He can make something that was unrighteous and He can put it to good use and He can make it holy. Only Jesus could do that. He cleansed you of all unrighteousness. He pronounced you justified. Why? Because from the cross, He looked down on you in grace and you looked up to Him in faith. <coughs> Consider Jesus, my holy brethren. Consider the One who made you holy when you were filthy with sin. Consider Jesus who when you were obedient to what this faith reveals, He caused us to be adoptive spiritual sons to God the Father with all the wonderful inheritance rights that comes with that. Yes, we're brethren. I live in Hallsville, Missouri. You live over here in Indiana. You're brethren. You're my brothers. You're my sisters. In every sense of the word, there's a commonality. There's a sharing in that, a fellowship. But did you know we're not only 
brethren with each other, but did you know we're also brethren with Jesus? Who shared in flesh and blood. Not, not, he's not ashamed to call you a brother. Look at chapter 2 in verse 11. For both he, still in Hebrews, chapter 2, verse 11, for both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Jesus is not ashamed to call me brother after all the horrible things that I've done? Yes. Why? Because He made me holy. Just as He made you holy. By His blood. Consider Jesus, you partakers in a heavenly calling. Oh, just consider Jesus for a moment who was not content to cleanse you of your sin and pat you on the head and say, good luck, pal. Consider the Christ to cleanse you of your sin, not only just to make you white as snow and to make you holy, but to lift you up and to seat you with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6. He transferred you from a place of darkness, kingdom of slavery, transferred you to this kingdom of His beloved Son, the kingdom of Christ. But what for? To reign with Him. He seated you with Him. You who belong to Him. You have been exalted. You've been lifted up to higher ground. We sing that song, higher ground. Me and you, He's lifted you up to higher ground. Is that not true? <coughs> to live above the world? You're a new creation in Christ. You have a brand new perspective. That's what 2 Corinthians 5 is saying. That you're a new creation. You don't view the world differently anymore. Why? Because you consider Jesus and it changed everything. Yes, you're bound to this world. Yes, there are, there are, are, are difficulties in this world and you're kind of you know, lashed down for the moment. But where's your citizenship? You know you belong in heaven. You know you're looking for a heavenly home. We studied that in Philippians 3 and verse 20. And from that position, from that heavenly citizenship, we await a Savior. You might be despised. You might be rejected among men. You might be persecuted at your job. You might be reviled by your neighbors. Made fun of by your schoolmates. Though they malign you. As Peter says, for not running headlong with them into the same excesses of dissipation, you still consider Jesus. All the suffering He endured for your sake so that you can partake in a heavenly calling. It is indeed the highest calling that we could ever be called to. There's no place higher than heaven. Jesus has called you to heaven. Consider Jesus who called you, 2 Thessalonians 2, 14, by the gospel to obtain what? Glory. Something that we can't get in its fullness down here. He's calling you to a higher plane. Lifting you up. Consider Him who gives you this inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, fadeth not away, kept in heaven for you. 1 Peter 1 and verse 4. You've not seen His shining face. You don't know what Jesus looks like in the flesh. You've not been like Paul. Marvelous visions. Are the grace of God taken up to the third heaven? Do you remember when Paul talks about that? 2 Corinthians. To see unspeakable things. You've not been there. But you still believe. You still have faith. Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. 1 Peter 1 and verse 8. And you believe that you will see Him someday. And your hope is living. Why? Because even now you partake. Little slices of heaven, don't you? You know, you're partaking in a little slice of heaven when you take the Lord's Supper, when you worship with saints, when you have fellowship with people of the same mind who are holy brethren. You can experience little fractions of that glory. But someday, you know, and I know, someday it's going to be fulfilled. We're going to get the full portion. We're going to get to see what Moses never saw. Who had to be held down in a rock, be covered by the hand of God. What a wonderful thing to think about. So consider Jesus who is described 
in two significant ways. First of all, he is the apostle of our confession. Every Christian has made a confession. You've made a confession if you're a holy brother, if you're a partaker of the heavenly calling. You've made a confession. But it is so much more than a, than a simple acknowledgement with the tongue that Jesus is Lord. This confession that you make, that I have made, it is a binding expression of our obligation and our commitment to Jesus as Lord. Binding. Jesus is the object of that confession. There's a definitive resolve to follow Jesus in that confession. Be loyal to Him. It's all wrapped up in that confession. Turn over to Romans 10. Romans 10 and verse 8 and 9. Romans 10, verse 8 and 9, Paul, the Apostle, says, what does it say? The Word is near you, in your mouth, in your heart. That is the Word of faith which we are preaching. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes resulting in righteousness and with the mouth he confesses resulting in salvation. See, now some of you didn't grow up in the church. Can I get a show of hands whose parents were not Christians? Quite a few of you. Can you think back in your life just for a moment? Can you remember a time when you would balk at making such a confession? I can't. Jesus? You mean the, the guy in, in the Bible? He's Lord to make that confession. Can you remember that in your life when people would have made fun of you for that? That you wouldn't... That'd be the last thing to pass your lips. What happened to change your heart? You considered Him. You actually opened up your heart. You opened up your mind to Jesus. You found out what He was all about. And it, it transformed you. Your heart and your tongue. Romans 10, 9 and 10. And it changed your behavior. We confess with our tongue, but more than that, we confess with our life. Read Matthew chapter 10. Jesus is strengthening His disciples here. Sending them out as sheep among these wolves. Don't be afraid! Don't be afraid of these men who can kill your body but can do nothing to harm your soul. And what does He say over here? Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33, Therefore, everyone who confesses Me before men, I will also confess him before My Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies Me before men, I will also deny him before My Father who is in heaven. When we make that open declaration, of our allegiance to Jesus. We must, we must publicly say, not only with our lips, it has to issue from the heart, it has to be played out in our lives, that Jesus is mine. You are our gospel. And people are reading you in Danville, and in Avon, in Brownsburg, wherever you live. And your life should say to those people, Jesus is mine. And when you live a life that says Jesus is mine and you get to the judgment, Jesus is going to say to the Father, He's mine. What a wonderful thing to think about. He's mine. They're not just words that you say before you get baptized in front of some friends. It's a pledge of allegiance. You live by that open confession, that claim on Him that He claimed us. He is the apostle of our confession. He is the apostle. The apostle of our confession. What is an apostle? Well, it's one who is sent, isn't it? You know the twelve apostles? One who is sent out by another who is in a position of authority to accomplish a task in His name. The Father sent Jesus on His side down to earth. Jesus is an apostle in the sense of the Greek word. John chapter 4 and verse 34. John chapter 4 and verse 34. Jesus came not to do His own will. No, 
No. These disciples were urging Jesus to eat. I said, I've got some food you don't know anything about, Jesus says. Here's my food, verse 34. My food is to do the will of Him who sent me and to accomplish His work. <laughs> Chapter 5 and verse 30. I can do nothing on my own initiative. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of Him who sent me. Jesus was sent from God, from heaven, to be His apostle, to execute His plan, the plan of redemption, a task in which He completed with perfect obedience. <coughs> perfect obedience. John 17 and verse 4. Glorify your Son. He says He finished the work. What did He say when He was on the cross he, before He gave up his, his soul? It is finished. I've done what I came to do. So consider Jesus now who was sent from God. Why was He sent from God? To come to you. To come specifically for you. Hebrews 2 and, and verse 10. Turn over there back to Hebrews. Hebrews 2 and verse 10. Verse 9 says, We do see Him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus. Because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God He might taste death for everyone. Verse 10, For it was fitting for Him, for whom are all things, and through whom are all things, in doing what? Bringing many sons to glory, to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. That's what Jesus came to do, to bring you to glory. To bring you to glory. He was sent from God to retrieve you. If Jesus could speak as He's speaking through these words, and He can talk to you in the pew tonight on Friday night, He would say to you, I came for you to bring you back. <coughs> you strange sheep, I came to bring you to glory. Consider Jesus then, who desires us. The apostle of our confession, but also He's the high priest of our confession. We won't get into all the work of the high priest. You're probably familiar with that. To high priest was to offer these atoning sacrifices for the people of God so that they could enjoy the, this continued fellowship with Him. You read through the Old Testament and week after week, festival after festival, year after year, these sacrifices were offered so they could be in this perpetual relationship with God. Jesus is the high priest. Consider Jesus, who is sent from God, the high priest of our confession. You were separated from God. You were absolutely powerless to reestablish your relationship with God. There was nothing that you could do by yourself to reestablish that relationship until God acted, until God sent His Apostle, Jesus. <coughs> Therefore, notice this. Jesus, He is the Apostle in that He represents God to us. He was sent from God to us to represent God to us. John says at the beginning of his Gospel, John in chapter 1, in verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I remember when I wasn't a believer reading that for the first time and thinking, John, what in the world are you talking about? And why did you capitalize W? Then I continued to read and it said down here, verse 14, he gives you a clue. And the Word became flesh. Oh, we're talking about a human being. And he dwelt among us. He tabernacled. He pitched his tent among us. And we saw his glory. Glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In verse 18, it says, No one has seen God at any time the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father. That's Jesus. That's the Word. He, Jesus, has explained Him that is God. What are the ramifications of that? If you desire to know the mind of God on anything, if you wonder in your mind as you're flipping through the television, would God care if I watch this? 
Would God care if I said this? How would God react in a situation like this? What are God's thoughts on this matter or that matter? What he's telling us, what John is telling us is to consider Jesus and you'll get the answer. He is a direct representation of his nature, the radiance of his glory. If you want to know what God's thoughts are on a matter, you consider Jesus. He is the apostle in that he represents God to mankind. He explains God to us. He is also the apostle of our confession. He's representing God to us. He's the high priest. He's representing us to God. He's uh, the apostle of our confession. He's representing God to us. And he's forever standing ready to intercede on our behalf because he was raised from the dead never to die again. And he tasted death. He tasted the sufferings. He was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. And so he can be sympathetic. I know what you're going through. You know, Jesus can never say, when we ask God for forgiveness, if we're a Christian, and we've been baptized into Him, and we have the atoning blood of Christ, we've been washed by that blood, and we have an advocate with the Father, and we come to God and say, God, forgive me! Jesus, our sympathetic high priest, can never say, I don't get it. Because He does. He's been tempted like you are. The difference is without sin. Have you ever really considered Jesus? I think that there are people who sit in church pews and never have really considered Jesus. And I ask you this evening, if you, if you haven't, if, if, if you would pause and, and you would read what the Gospels say about this man, you would give Him your full attention for just a few moments. Do you want to meet Him? Do you want Him to speak to you? He has something to say to you. But He's not going to speak outside of this Word. He's not going to come to you in a still, small voice in the night and whisper in your ear. He's going to speak through this Word. Why? Because in these last days, God has spoken to us through His Son. Hebrews 1 and verse 2. Many have never considered Jesus because they've never considered this Word. You're not going to meet Jesus outside of this Word. And so I encourage you this evening, if, if you've never done that, to think about that. Think about Jesus. Consider Him. And if we can help you in any way to deepen that relationship, just let us know. Now, we don't want to end this service tonight without extending an invitation to you. And there might be some, some folks who have been thinking about that here this evening. I don't know your situation. There might be some folks who are thinking, you know, I, I really need to get baptized. I've been considering Jesus for a long time. And this is when the Bible needs to get practical. You need to put your consideration into action. You do the right thing. Follow Jesus into death. Bury that old person of sin so that He can be your high priest, the apostle of your confession. Come forward as we stand and sing right now.